If you're watching online, I just want to say thanks for doing so. Many people watch our services live as well as the replay throughout the week. I do want to extend you an invitation, though. If you're ever in Texas, in the Bryan College Station area, why don't you come out to a New Heights Church service live? I promise me and everybody here, we'll make you feel right at home in Jesus' name. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Open your Bible to Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10. We're in the middle of a series that I'm calling Silence the Cynics. And it centers around one question. It centers around uh, uh, a question that I feel like the Lord posed to me in January. And I, I'm going to ask the question again. I've asked it every week. But if you haven't heard it, you're about to hear it for the first time. And I don't want you to hear it with a shallow part of your mind. I want you to hear the question from the depths of your soul. Like we've got about 20, maybe 30 more minutes here. Let's really try to get free. Can we do that? Here's the question. What would your life look like? If you honest to God lived without regard to what people think about you, what would your life look like if you lived without regard to what people think about you? Now, I don't mean like being a jerk, okay? Like I'm just going to talk how I want, act how I want, and, and I don't care. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about those cynical thoughts in your head that maybe come from a conversation you had 15 or 20 years ago. From your first marriage that failed the cynical thoughts that boomerang back into your mind that, that, that make you think it's always gonna, you're always just, uh, you're one step away from the whole thing falling apart in your hands. Maybe, maybe you used to be hooked on drugs and, and the thought keeps boomeranging around in your head that, that, that before it's over, you're just gonna go right back to that same thing and it plagues you. Yep. Maybe you feel less than in front of other people. What would your life look like if you, if you were free from the opinions of others and most importantly, the cynical thoughts and the insecurities in your own mind? What would it be like? What, what would it sound like? What would your day look like? Who would you encourage that you don't encourage now because you're concerned about what they would think about you? Who at the office walks in and they're, they're, they're like a half a bubble off? You, you see them, and, and usually they're, they're chipper, and they're great, and they're good, but you can tell something's going on, and, and, and on the inside, you want to say, hey, is everything okay? Can I pray for you about something? Is there something that I can help you with? But you don't, because what will they think about me? Will they think I'm taking it too far? Will they think I'm pressing my beliefs on them? Who would you minister to? Who would you witness to that you don't witness to now? See, most people that love the Lord, they want to win the loss. They want to witness to people, but they're hesitant because of concern of what they will think about them. Oh, will they? What will they say? How will I even start the conversation? How will I not start the conversation? What if they say no? What if this? What if that? What if? I run almost my entire life, and, and those that I, I work with closely, they, they, they almost all know this. I, work, I run nearly everything in my life through a, a, a filter. I call it the best case, worst case filter. Now, if the Lord speaks to me to do something, I'm going to do it, and I'm not interested in the challenges. We're just going to accomplish it. But most of your life is not filled that way. Most of your life is you making a decision by faith to do something, to not do something, or, or to continue something, or stop something. But, but there's a filter that I run almost everything through. I call it the best case, worst case filter. And it's simple like this. It's like, what's the best case scenario that could happen if I do it? And what's the worst case scenario that could happen if I do it? Let me give you an example. A high wire across the Grand Canyon. Best case, worst case. Best case, you're going to get a good view. Best case, you're going to get an awesome selfie. Worst case, eh, you're Wiley e. Coyote in the Roadrunner cartoon. <laughs> See, we have some Looney Tune fans in the house. <laughs> Best case, worst case. Here's another one. You're five minutes late to a pizza party. 
You get on the highway and you know I could drive the speed limit and I'll be five minutes late. Or I could drive 85 or 90 miles an hour and I'll only be two minutes late. So best case scenario, if I decide to drive 90, I'm gonna be two minutes late instead of five minutes late. Worst case scenario could be tragic, but we'll temper it a little bit. So instead of it being tragic, the worst case scenario is you get to meet one of the Brazos Valley's finest. You get to see pretty lights. You get to look at, you know, one of your, one of your old pictures in your wallet. And they don't just want to talk to you. They're going to want your autograph. Best case, worst case. Best case, worst case with a coworker with a friend or your family that you can tell is going through a challenge. Worst case scenario, you say, hey, can, is there something I can pray with you about? No, and leave me alone. That's about as bad as it could get. Best case scenario, they get born again. Their kids get born again. Their spouse gets born again. And every generation beyond them goes to heaven because you refuse to listen to the insecurities that are boomeranging in your mind and you choose to silence the cynics and actually be what God has called you to be in your life. Best case, worst case. It happened to me the other day. I'm in the restroom at a restaurant and I'm waiting on my son and this guy comes up. How many of you know it can be awkward talking in a restroom to somebody? All you girls are like, it's not awkward at all. We got a restroom in a herd. <laughs> I didn't realize that, by the way. I have, I have two brothers, so it was, it was all of us. Like, going to the restroom was not an event. It was just, if you're at a restaurant, you just get up, go to the restroom. You, then I started, you know, being around Crystal, and, and we started, you know, date. I was dating her, and I had to round all these guys. And she'd be like, I got to go to the restroom. And in unison, every female at the table would go, okay, let's go to the restroom. <laughs> And then they would all come out of the restroom looking like glamour shots. I'm like, what, did y'all, what is in y'all's restroom? Look like they've been at the salon. But I'm in the restroom and this guy comes up. He's like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, hey, pretty good. I said, I said, he said, he said man, this weather here like, in Texas is crazy. It's like hot, it's cold, it's raining, it's not, it's, it's just crazy. I said, yeah, Texas weather's crazy. He goes, man, it's got me sick. I've been sick ever since I got here. I said, oh, well, God will heal your body. And he did exactly what you just did. He was like, what did you say? <laughs> I'm sitting here talking about the common cold, and you're talking about, you know, Jesus Christ. I said, I said God will heal your body. Did you know that? Now, I'll be honest with you. I may never see that guy again. I'm not saying it happens every time I talk to somebody, but I don't want to miss an opportunity because I care so much about what somebody thinks about me that I don't give them the opportunity to choose Jesus, the same Jesus that changed my very life. So I said to him, I said, I said, I said hey, I said, man, God will heal your body. I said, you want me to pray for you? I said, God will heal your body right here. He goes, no, I don't want you to pray for me. I said, you sure? He said, he said, he said I'm absolutely sure. I said, all right, bro, be blessed. That was the worst case scenario. Best case scenario, he lives next to me in in heaven. So we've got to look at it as we're silencing the cynics in our life and begin to realize these, these things that are yelling at you, that are stopping you from helping the people around you, they are paper tigers. These cynical thoughts, once you decide to silence them, once you decide to scratch them from your mind, you're actually free to begin to witness to people the same way that somebody was brave enough to witness to you. Come on, give God a big hand of praise this morning. (laughs) Romans 10, 9, I'm gonna read this real quick. The Bible says you gotta confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Somebody say saved. So to be saved, you have to believe with your heart and confess with your mouth if you're capable of it. So that means that you can say one thing and not believe it and you won't get the result or you can believe one thing and not say it, you won't get the result. So if you've spent your life saying, I don't care what people think about me, if we're real honest, who has ever said that before? I have said that. I don't care what people think about me. One person, praise the Lord. (laughs) Everybody else, dishonest. We've all said it. 
But you got to line this up because the scripture also says, as a person thinks in their heart, so is he. We've got to say, we've got to realize, listen, I don't care what people think. I'm not moved by what people think. But then we've got to rewire the whole mainframe and realize I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what somebody else thinks I am. I'm not what somebody says about me. I'm not what they don't say about me. I'm not where they invited me. I'm not where they didn't invite me. I'm not who they think I am when I'm around them. I'm not who they think I am when I'm not around him. I am a complete summation of what God says I am. And he says I am a son of the most high God, fearfully and wonderfully made. Blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed and cannot, somebody say cannot, cannot be cursed. Did you know if a witch tried to throw a hex on you, it would fall lifeless to the ground in front of you because you cannot be cursed? But you have to not just say that. Come on, somebody, you got to believe that which means there has to be a rewiring take place. You have to change your belief structure to put it in congruence with the Bible because the, the scripture goes on to say there in Romans that it is with the heart that we actually believe unto righteousness. You're not righteous by what you did. In other words, the access to God that you have, you did not earn, but you deserve it. You did not earn your access to God, but you deserve it. We have to get past the fact that we didn't earn it. Not one good deed can get you more righteous than you were previously. Only the blood of Jesus can make you righteous. And only the love of God validates who you are through the acceptance of the, of the fact that Jesus gave his life for you, defeated death, hell, and the grave, and walked boldly out of a borrowed tomb. So for you and for me, we have to get, back, back, we have to get past the concept that we are earning anything in the body of Christ or in the kingdom. You didn't earn it, but you deserve it. Let me give you an example. If you went to a restaurant with me and I was going to buy your dinner, who here would like me to buy your dinner? Just, just like a, a taco or, a, or maybe some gorditas or maybe some, some barbecue. Is anybody getting hungry yet? I'm, I'm even hungry. Even like some Cracker Barrel. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to buy everybody's lunch today. Meet me at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> if they're open, I'll buy it. <laughs> Get your purse. We're out of here. <laughs> if I were to take you to dinner and say, hey, I'm going to buy your dinner. And, and, and I said, man, I got you this beautiful, beautiful steak. It's wonderful. Baked potato. Man, I am getting hungry. A steak and a baked potato. Got some green beans, some macaroni and cheese. Then afterwards, we're going to have some apple pie. And God help us, we're going to have ice cream on the apple pie. It's going to be wonderful. And, and you sit there, and the food's laying in front of you, and you don't eat it. It's, I can't eat this. I didn't earn it. But I paid for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I didn't earn it. When you reject the grace of God and walking in it, it despises the price that was paid for the access. It wouldn't bless me for you to reject what I paid for. On the contrary, you would be despising the gift that I was trying to give. We have to get past the idea that we didn't earn our salvation. Nobody does. But you still as a son or a daughter, deserve the access that's been paid for. Somebody give God another hand of praise here in the house. We're talking about silencing the cynics this morning. Open your Bible to John chapter 12, verse number one. John chapter 12, verse number one. This is very interesting because this is right after Jesus had gone and he raised the guy from the dead. The guy's name was Lazarus. He raised him from the dead after he was dead for four days. It was very interesting because he had heard about the problem and he was headed over there and he was gonna, uh, uh, he was gonna uh, either heal him or raise him from the dead. The disciples and everybody understood that. And Lazarus had two sisters, one named Mary and one named Martha. They both met Jesus after Lazarus had died and they were like, Jesus, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, don't worry, he's gonna live again. They're like, yeah, we know he's gonna live again in the day of, res in, in the day of resurrection. He said, no, 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 I'm telling you, I am the resurrection. 
resurrection and the life. Your brother's going to live again. And the Bible says that he saw everybody crying. And the Bible said that Jesus even cried. And he was so upset that his friend was dead. And he walked over to where the tomb was. And the tomb was there. It was hewn out into a rock. There was a big stone that was blocking everybody from going in or blocking anything from getting in. Because they had to like stop animals and stuff from going in there. And the Bible says that he looked at the guys there. He said, hey, get that stone out of the way. They got the stone out of the way, and all of a sudden, Jesus said, Lazarus, with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The Bible says Lazarus all of a sudden was laying there dead as a doornail, and then boom, life shot back into his lifeless body. He was wrapped in burial clothes or burial cloth, and the Bible says he told him to come out of there, and he waddled out of there in the burial clothes that he had, and they, he said, now go over there and unwrap him, and they, they unwrapped him, and all of a sudden, Lazarus was now alive again who was once dead. Now, what's interesting is Jesus, who obviously raised the dead, probably could have moved the stone. But he asked those around the miracle or the necessity of the miracle to do what they could do, which would then position him to do what they could not do. Sometimes in your life, God's trying to ask you to do something. You're like, God, why don't you do it? He's like, because I'm asking you to do what you can do because I'm about to do what you cannot do. So the Bible says that Lazarus is raised from the dead. And now uh, they're all celebrating. It's a great time. They're all celebrating, John chapter number 12. And they're sitting there at six days. Uh, the Bible says it is six days before Passover. They're at Bethany where Lazarus, which was dead, who Jesus raised from the dead, verse two. It said, there they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him, verse three. Now, Mary and Martha were Lazarus' sisters. Mary, one of Lazarus' sisters, took a pound of ointment of spikenard, which was very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled. Somebody say filled. Filled with the odor or the perfume of the ointment. Number one, if you are going to silence the cynics in your life, you're going to have to worship God anyway. There will always be reasons and things happen that we don't understand. But if you're going to silence those cynical thoughts and you're going to get insecurities off the table, you're going to have to worship in spite of the situation. The Bible says she came in there and she took, it was very interesting this ointment, it was, a, it was like, a, like a, a, a beautiful smelling perfume. And when she anointed Jesus' feet, the Bible says that as she did that, the entire room was filled with the perfume or the smell of what she was pouring out. Did you know God never planned a bad service? He never looked over at Gabriel and said, I tell you what, New Heights had a pretty good Sunday last week. I mean, it was awesome. But send them a dud this week. No. What's happening is God is everywhere all the time, but he drastically responds to the worship of his people. When you come in here on a difficult day, when the washer broke, the dryer broke, you had four flat tires on the way to church and you look down and your kids got two left shoes on. <laughs> but in spite of it all, you say for the next 30 minutes, for the next 45, however long we're gonna be here, I'm gonna lift my hands, I'm gonna worship God. All of a sudden, the perfume, the savor, the atmosphere begins to shift because when you are gonna silence the cynics, you're gonna have to get good at worshiping God regardless of your situation. Amen. You know, most people... A lot of people go buy a car and they finance it, so they buy their car on credit. A lot of people go and buy a house and they finance, they buy the house on credit. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, from, especially whenever you're being wise with your money. But I just wonder, sometimes we worship God for what he has already done, but I'm just wondering, I think we ought to be able to worship God on credit. 
I think we ought to be able to worship God based off what he is going to do in our life. I think we ought to worship God when we say, I know my prodigal son and daughter is coming home. I know I'm blessed in the city, blessed. I know he's going to make a way for me where there was no way. I know the doctor's report says one thing, but I'm standing on the report of the Lord. He said, by his stripes, I am healed. I'm believing that. I'm worshiping him on that. And I'm not backing off just because everything around me doesn't look like that. If you're going to silence the cynics, you got to worship God anyway. Somebody say worship. worship. You got to get good at it. You got to get good at, at, at recognizing I can't just spend my life paying attention to everything I see. He said specifically, we don't live by what we see. We live by, come on, somebody say faith. faith. We don't live by sight. We live by faith. So for you and for me, we've got to get to that place where we begin to say, I don't see it right now. Come on, I can't even feel it right now. I wish I could get somebody to encourage me right now. I'm just in the valley of despair. Everything's going on. But then you get a different mindset and you do like King David did, which is a man after God's own heart. If you got to find your way into a cave by yourself, you start encouraging yourself in the Lord and you begin to believe God at what he said. And now you're worshiping him, not just because of what he has done. You're worshiping for what you know he is going to do. Man. If you're going to silence the cynics, you've got to worship God anyway. They're not going away, some of them. Some of your cynics will be there because God needs you to be a spectacle in front of them. The Bible says she took the, the ointment, she anointed his feet, wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which would betray him, said this, Why wasn't this oil sold for 300 pence or 300 pieces of silver and given to the poor? Sounds real holy, doesn't it? Religion often does. In other words, number one, you're going to have to worship God anyway. Number two, you're going to have to commit in every situation to give your best. Give your best in worship. Give your best in encouragement. Give your best through the storm. Come on, when times get tight, that's not the time to stop tithing and offering. That's the time to verify to the devil that I don't trust my money more than I trust my God. You're going to have to give anyway because there's always going to be that cynical, that cynical voice that's going to say, I know what to do with your money better than you know what to do with your money. Some of you, it might be your parents. Some of you, it might be your kids. Some of you, it might be a friend. Some of you, it might be somebody else where where everybody's got a better idea about what you should do with your resources than you do. Because what happens is this. Your money doesn't represent just your money. It represents your whole life. There's nothing else that you do where you get up and you leave your family. Some of you, four or five o'clock in the morning, you got to get up to get the kids ready to make sure everything's put together, to get them on the school bus on time. 15 minutes after the school bus, you got to get to work. You get to work, all of a sudden, one of them's got an earache. You got to go check them out at school. Then you got to figure out where am I going to put my kid during school. Then you got to work late to cover the time that you missed. And everything comes together. It's not just your money you're giving to God. It represents everything you do in your life. It's, I don't just work for money. I, I don't just, and I know you don't just for that, but let me tell you something. The day they quit paying you is the day you quit showing up. Well, he's right there, Ethel. I guarantee it. I mean, I like what I do, but I tell you what, they better, that, that check better not bounce. Well, there's nothing wrong with that because the reality is, is your finances, that's why the Bible says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also because your resources are so closely tied to your whole life. That's why the Bible says this, money answers all things. It verifies what you care about, what you're passionate about, what you honor at the highest level. That's why when you want to go buy a house or a car, the first thing they ask you to determine if they'll loan you some money is, let me see your money. Man, this thing took a turn, Jake. 
Let me see how you handle money. What do you value? Because if you want to go buy a a, a $200,000 house and you're spending $500, you know, a weekend on on, uh, cigarettes and alcohol and it's just burned up, let me tell you something. They're going to look at that and they're going to go, there's somebody who's not disciplined with their finances. We're not loaning them the money to buy that house. Because your money answers everything. Literally. So the scripture says that, that she's sitting there and she pours out 300 pieces of silver worth of whatever she has. That was one year's salary for most people in that day and age. But let me ask you this. When God rescued your brother, did you thank him? Because this is exactly what happened. Her brother was rescued from the grip of death. And she said, I don't know what I need to do, but bless God, I got to do something. She walked in and humbled herself and she began to worship God and she took the very best. Well, there's a trying season in your life. Those cynical thoughts are going to tell you, oh, you don't need to do that. You need to stop all that. And she didn't listen to any of that. Isn't it interesting that she never answered Judas? Did you know you don't have to answer all your cynics? You don't even have to answer every question everybody asks you. Think about it. Jesus was asked all kinds of questions all the times, but he only answered the question he wanted to answer. You know when you're trying to be trapped. Just because they ask it doesn't mean you have to answer it. If it's going to cause a bunch of division and it's not, a, it's not something where heaven or hell is on the line, you don't have to answer it. Look, if somebody asks you uh, if the Dallas Cowboys are, the, are America's team, the answer is yes. <laughs> just, just go. But if they ask you about the Houston Texans, all you got to do is say, well, they hadn't left Houston yet. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. You talking about the Oilers? No, they left already. Just because somebody asks you a question doesn't mean you have to answer it. Just because somebody's trying to pick a fight with you doesn't mean you have to respond. She just kept right on worshiping God. Judas sitting there going, man, we could have sold that for 300 pieces of silver. But the Bible says he didn't say that because he cared for the poor. Verse 6 says he said that because he was a thief and he had the bag. He carried the money for the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he bare, one translation says, he stole or skimmed from the top of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, don't you think Jesus knew that? The Bible says he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. It wasn't long after this that God was, that Jesus was preparing the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, and even Judas was there. See, you need your adversary close because your adversary is verification that your banquet is about to begin. The Bible says, the Bible says, he said, he said, he said, he said, we could have sold this for 300 pieces of silver and given it to the poor. Nothing in the Bible is there by accident. Did you know that Jesus was sold by Judas and he was sold for 30 pieces of silver, which is 10% of 300, AKA the tithe on what he was complaining about. Do you see how money answers all things? It's a very powerful connection when you begin to put it in, in play. Now, what I, what I like about this is Mary didn't pour it out when Judas said, we could have sold this for 30 pieces of silver. She didn't look up while she was worshiping and go, why don't you shut up, Judas? Because <laughs> when you don't care what people think about you, you'll worship anyway. When, when, you, don't, when you know already, he said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. He said, he said, you'll never give up anything in this life that God won't give you back a hundredfold in every area, houses, everything. He said, you, you'll never give up anything. He said, but it comes with persecution. Let's say this under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Stop being surprised by the persecution. Your level of persecution that God is allowing you to endure is directly proportional to the a level of trust that he has that you will endure through it. You've got to get to the place 
where your cynics stop controlling your behavior. They stop controlling your mind. Just because somebody cuts you off in traffic, stop letting it ruin your day. Just because somebody didn't say hello to you or they, they left you out of something or they, they reminded you of a failure, stop letting it control who you are. Isn't that the carpenter's son? They missed the Messiah trying to look back on what his beginning looked like. There are people that God will bring into your life that will celebrate your now and not try to remind you of your past failures. But that does not exclude us from the necessity of being kind and walking in love even when people are not kind and walking in love towards us. You wanna silence the cynics like for real? You wanna take insecurities off the table? You're gonna have to worship God anyway. I don't understand why is this taking so long? I didn't think this thing was gonna take that long. Well, I didn't either, but it is. Worship God anyway. Yeah, but, but, but times are tight and you know, if I just did this, if I just did that, no, 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 no. Give your best anyway. He's too faithful. The Bible says that he, he, he didn't say that because he cared about the poor. He said it because he was a thief. Verse seven says this. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. Picture it now. Jesus is sitting here. And, and while he's sitting, can you get me a chair, Jake? While he's sitting, he's literally having somebody uh, wash his feet and put uh, ointment all over his feet as she's washing him. Sit it right here for me, bro. She's washing, she's washing him and she's wiping him off with her tears. Now, this is not how he was sitting. In those days, it would have been a very low, if it was a table at all, it was probably just a cloth, but, but if it was a table, it was a low table and he would have been sitting kind of lounging with his feet behind him. In other words, she didn't even ask for a seat at the table. She just wanted to worship him. So his feet are sitting behind and he's lounging and he's eating with Lazarus and everybody's having a great time because they're supposed to be, uh, they're supposed to still be in mourning. But the Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. He'll turn your mourning into dancing. And, and she's sitting there and she's, she's, she's anointing Jesus' feet and she's wiping his feet with her hair. And, and, and Jesus sitting there, and he wasn't sitting exactly like this, but, but just for the sake of this, he, he's sitting there and, and Judas is like, Jesus, We could have sold that. Isn't it interesting how everybody knows what you should do with your stuff? Jeez, we could have sold that for 300 pieces of silver. Sounds holy when you say it. We could have sold that and given it to the poor. When the truth is, he was actually saying, I wish you'd have sold that and put it in this bag because I steal what comes out of the bag. And the Bible says that, that Mary, she just goes right on worshiping. She goes right on wiping his feet with her hair. And Jesus says, why don't you shut your mouth, Judas? Can't you see that? Let her alone. Won't you shut your mouth, Judas? Against the day of my bearing, she kept this. For the poor you have with me, with you, but me, you don't have always. The poor you have always with you, but me, you don't have always. Number three. You are defended. Let the cynics just, let them be quiet. I don't, I don't know. But Judas, it said that he stole from the bag. I would call that a devourer. In the book of Malachi, that's how Adam says it. In the book of Malachi, it says he will, it says if we'll tithe and offer, he'll rebuke the 
the devourer. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. She's just worshiping. Everybody's going, what is that smell? God, that smells good. To worship you, I live. Everybody's benefiting. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. She's poured out her very best. And all of a sudden, the devourer, the one that steals, comes up to Jesus. We could have given that to the poor. And just like the book of Malachi says, Jesus, your defender. Remember, the Bible says in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and don't forget his benefits. There's some benefits to serving God. One of those benefits is he's your shield and your buckler. He will defend you. You don't have to defend yourself all the time. Let me say that differently. Stop defending yourself all the time. Oh, but they said this about me. Of course they did. You're a leader. Of course they did. You scare the devil. Of course they did. They're intimidated. Of course they did. What they need to know is that you love them even though they don't love you. He said he'll rebuke the devourer. She's sitting there pouring everything out. And all of a sudden, we could have sold that and given it to the poor. Let her alone, Judas. She's done this against my burial. What you don't understand is I just unburied her brother and I'm, there, I'm preparing myself to be buried. Well, why didn't he throw Judas out of the room? Because your table is in the presence of your enemies. You have to remember you are defended. You are not defenseless. The Bible says that you have an advocate with the Father. An advocate's like an attorney. I've been in need of attorneys before, employed their services. They represent you. And oftentimes they will tell you, let me do the talking. Mary's sitting there worshiping. And it's like Jesus is going, no, Mary, I got this. Shut your mouth, Judas. You don't have a clue. Some of you are being attacked and you're being attacked because of your level of worship. Some of you are being ridiculed. I'm just wondering what you're gonna do about it. Because if you decide to answer the cynics, now you speak for yourself. But if you'll just worship God anyway, if you'll just pour out your very best, if you'll remind yourself that he is your shield. He is actively defending you. You'll see what some people never get to see. You'll see a life so free that you realize it's not even your job to defend yourself. He, he said this. The Bible said that David, one time he was so excited after a great victory and he was dancing in the street. Probably like this. <laughs> that was the floss. <laughs> Y'all remember this one? <laughs> the cabbage patch. How about this one? MC Hammer? to quit. Hi, hi. <laughs> hammer, yo, hammer, MC, hammer, yo, hammer. And for all you that are stuck in the 90s, ice, ice, baby. Mm -hmm. He only had one hit, but it was a hit. Tell you what, how many hits you need, you know? 
That's more than you got. Go ahead, eyes. Stop. Clap right and listen. <laughs> David, come back for a victory. And just, just dance and just, man, my God, look what he's doing. Oh, stop it. What's wrong with you? You're making a fool of yourself. And David said, you think I'm making a fool of myself now? I'm not turning anything down. I'm turning it up. See, when you decide to silence the cynics, you're going to have to get comfortable dancing even when things are critical. Let's all close our eyes and lift our hands. Lord, I sent you here in this place, and I'm asking you to do what only you can do today. As we pour out our worship onto you, I, I'm asking you, God, to do what you did for Mary, to silence the cynics. Set us free to worship. You could have healed Lazarus, but it was a greater thing to raise him from the dead. That was exceedingly abundantly above more than anybody was thinking and anybody was asking. I sense there's a lot of people here today that are wondering, how come this hasn't happened? How come that hasn't happened? Lord, show yourself strong. Do what only you can do. Bring the prodigals home. Bring that promotion. Those that are believing God for a transaction, let it take place. Those that need favor in the judicial system, in the court system, give them that favor, Lord. Those that are bound by drugs, alcohol, things they shouldn't be looking at. God, show yourself strong. Rebuke the devourer off of their life. As we come in this place today to worship you in spite of what we see, to give our best in spite of what we see, and to remember you are defending us even now. Set us free to witness, to invite people to church that may be far from God. To pray for that loved one, that coworker. To trust that even though we hear the criticism and the cynicism and some of it's in our own mind. We're not those thoughts. We're what you say. And you say we are yours. Not because we've earned it. But because you shed your blood for us. Hey guys. We just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Here at New Heights, we are passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you've experienced today, you can also revisit this message you just watched or any other sermon at newheightschurch.info. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.